Thanks for coming again, guys. I know it's been a long day. Um, what we're going to do today is have a look at some of the labs that we've got and see if they're still fulfilling the roles that we intended for them. I also want to know if you think the students are getting out of the labs what we expected them to get out of it. But first of all, let me explain a little bit about what I think experiments are for. Um, if we go back to the whole reason for doing experiments, scientists don't jump up in the morning and go, I'm going to create an experiment today. They usually get up and go, coffee. <laughs> okay. Usually you have different experiments for different areas of science. So the types of experiments that physicists would do would be different experiments to the ones that biologists do. The area of science also determines what type of question you have. So if you've got, let's say, water moving through a cell, physicists will start talking about different pressures on different sides of the cell wall, whereas biologists might be talking about why the water needs to be in there for the cell to develop and so on. But they will be asking different questions, which will lead to different reasons for the experiment. They'll be looking and trying to find out different properties, different aspects of our situation, and the different reason for the experiment gives you different experimental designs. So you wouldn't expect biologists to come up with mechanical type experiments, they would go and ask physicists and they would work together on these things. So there are significant experiments in every field and they're different for every field. So let's look at some of the reasons that I've been thinking about. First of all, you might want to find out some information, maybe how deep is the ocean? And so you'll go and actually test it. You'll do an investigative type of an experiment. Sometimes you might want to explore a relationship. You're still doing an investigative experiment. Something like perhaps looking at the wind speed, power output of a wind turbine. Or perhaps you are trying to find out a quantity, maybe the density of wood, something like that. These are all investigative type design experiments. Perhaps you're trying to test a prediction. So you something like, let's have a prediction. From what we know, as water cools, it gets more dense. So therefore, as it gets more dense, um, the ice should be even more dense than the water and it should sink. But the ice doesn't sink. So that means we've falsified our prediction. So we tested our initial weird prediction. We found it was wrong. We learned something. We had to come up with a new explanation. We came up with the explanation we all understand. And that's a good thing because it takes you the next step, then you start looking for other things. Or maybe we're trying to test fundamental understandings. And it might be quite difficult to test that. So if we use the example of climate change, you can't actually prove that climate change is wrong. So what you can't do the falsifying the claim bit on it that we did here. So what you have to do is collect so much data that in the end it can't be anything else except what you're talking about. And this is where we're at at the moment. Scientists are saying that there is so much data that climate change is in effect a human induced change. So the reason for doing all this is that when you make a claim about something and you say believe us because we have analysed the data, that's what it's all about. The experiments we've done are the support our claim or they refute our claim but in any case we will come to some conclusions. If it supports the claim it will be one type of conclusion, if it refutes the claim it will be another type of conclusion but in any case we've analysed the data and therefore you can believe us that our conclusions are right. So that's the reasons for doing experiments. Now student experiments are a little bit different to that. So that was what scientists do. This is what students do. We've got student experiments and they can be experiential. So in other words, we are trying to get the students to have an experience. We still might be getting them to do all of those other things on the other side, but we also want them to have some experience of while they're doing it, like the effect of insulation on hot water as it cools down. So they experience something that's cooling down and they see the data that comes from it. We could be training their skills which is why we'd start with hand-drawn graphs instead of going straight to computer-generated graphs so they understand what the line of best fit is. And we could be trying to get them to consolidate their knowledge, like with our experiment down there on conservation of angular momentum. They've already learnt the physics, but they haven't actually come to grips with it and hands-on. And this gives them the chance to take their textbook learning and their formulas and their diagrams and they put them all together into one big experience. So student labs are a little bit different to the types of labs that scientists do. We don't expect students to discover the acceleration of gravity, we already know that, 
but we do want them to learn a lot of skills along the way. So what I want you to do is to take the form that we've got here and then just put tick yes, maybe no, whether that lab actually could help the students learn that bullet pointed thing that we've got there. And it goes through and it looks at different aspects of the labs. And there'll be cookbook labs and there'll be student-directed experiments. Circle which one it is so that we can tally up which ones are doing what as we go along. OK, do you think you've got the idea of what's going on? Yeah? Excellent. Off we go. So we'll start off with some stuff on the ruler. So if I to grab a stick tape, the scissors, and cut it off. Then what we'll do, I'll get the stick tape on there. I'll grab that. Then I'm just going to try and flick it off. All right. Just going to grab these. Might as well do it here so it's somewhere in the line of sight. Grabbing the stick tape again. Put that back on top of there. And then maybe you put some weights on top or something. So we'll probably just go through and tick off some things now. Evaluating the quality of your own work. That's a pretty important one for this one. Reading instructions. What do you reckon, Nick? So there was uh, some instructions there. Yep. Okay. Memory serves. Pretty important. So how do they actually go about taking the measurements? Well, usually what they'll do is they'll lift this just to the point where it just starts to slide. So that's when everything's just in equilibrium. So we can mark the adjacent distance. And we can mark distance. where it tips there. Then we just can just measure the hypotenuse. OK, good. So do you think that consolidates their scientific knowledge? I do, yeah. Yep, OK. And they don't graph any data, do they? No. no. Um, so they don't write reports with this one. They apply their content knowledge. Yes. All right. Yeah, so it's spinning roads, doing angular momentum type things. Yeah. Um, so that's, this lab's all about, oh, it's getting some data there, so that's good. Okay, so that lab's all about getting angular momentum data. Yeah. Um, we can go through and collect the whole set, but I think we probably don't. For this one, do they have to recognise what data needs to be collected? They do because uh, energy data isn't as relevant. Some of the energy is lost, it's not conserved. Okay, so they do have to do that. Um, deciding what to test and how to test it. I do think that they usually do. It's uh, especially if you push it too hard that it comes off the track. Okay, all right. Working out what data is significant and should be recorded? I think so because you need to know when there is a gross error or when you've not pushed it enough. And calibrating equipment? Yeah, they have to know the temperature for That's the right, sensors. Yeah. yeah, they do.